finished boat on the river. This is on a good day. And this is on a bad day. In 1983, uh, we had a prior trip and we were on the river in July of 83. And the river had just peaked at uh, 93 or 94,000 cubic feet per second. It had gone down to 83,000 by the time we started. Uh, all of us were really uh, amateur boatmen at the time, and uh, we were not prepared for what we experienced down there at those high flows. We had a couple of accidents and some people evacuated, and by the time we got down to the mouth of Pike Creek, uh, we found it necessary to have a meeting. Uh, half the group thought this was the greatest thing that they had ever done in their lives, and the other half of the group felt otherwise. And the second group kind of won the discussion. So uh, we all had to hike out and the boats were helicoptered out. Uh, kind of a sad end to a real adventure. So this is where it all begins. A picture taken from the top of the chocolate cliffs. Uh, the Perea is entering just out of the picture to the right and you can see how it's changing the color, color of the Colorado. Something that I find really interesting and sometimes I teach uh, beginning geology, but I try to always point out that this Kaibab limestone here at Lee's Ferry is at river level and you can take one step and go all the way from the rim to the river in just that one step. And this boundary here is of particular interest, uh, the boundary between the top of the Kaibab and the bottom of the Molenkopi because it marks the division between the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic uh, period of time. And this is the great dying that geologists have spoken of when Something like 90% of all plant and animal species on the planet died off. And that happened somewhere, sometime in between the deposition of the Kaibab and the deposition of the Molenkopi, sitting right there on top. So as you drive from Flagstaff up to Lee's Ferry, uh, last half of the way, you're on top of the Kaibab, and uh, you're driving right along the Great Dying Boundary. Well, this is kind of an idealized river trip, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, for those of you who have not been on the river, uh, I've counted something like uh, 360 camps on the river in Grand Canyon. So I think I've been on about a third of those. Uh, they vary a lot. Some of them are really small. Others are gigantic. You could have a whole army stay on them. Uh, your days on the river are punctuated by visits to side canyons, and uh, if you're a boatman in particular, your days are punctuated by running the, the rapids. But really beautiful places along the way, such as uh, Redwall Cavern or Elves Cavern. Uh, day hiking off the river. Uh, this is a route near Stone Creek, uh, coming down through the Tapetes. in Macadamiba Canyon. <coughs> These are my nieces, and they like to take the hard way, but they're rewarded farther up. Uh, the little ledge going into Deer Creek. I think this photograph actually makes it look worse than it actually is. And back at Macadamiba, uh, one of the things that I really enjoy about river trips is the adventure of it, but it's also just a chance to be a kid again and to just have fun. So here we are. Uh, we've decided to dam up Macadamiba Creek. Uh, and we're using the only materials available to us. So we're going to let this pool fill up behind us. And then uh, everybody stands up at the same time and creates a little flash flood. And this is. I don't know, it doesn't seem that much fun tonight, but on the river it's <laughs> At other times it seems more entertaining. Well, that's hard work damming up rivers like that. <laughs> Jim DeVenny and uh, Dave Dryden are worn out by the experience. The river, of course, changes colors. Uh, it always used to flow muddy, uh, but since Glen Canyon Dam went in, it now can flow clear. Uh, but if there's a flood uh, down the Little Colorado or the Perea, most likely, or any of the other small tributaries downstream from the dam, it can also still turn muddy even today. And all shades of brown and red and green are possible. Well, the rapids, uh, 
I was on a river trip uh, the first time I had rowed in a few years this summer. And I was rowing for a commercial company, and I don't know what's happened, but I used to love running the rapids in Grand Canyon, and they're starting to scare me. Um, I didn't think that would happen, but uh, something happens when you get to my age, I guess. Uh, there are there are accidents on the river, and when we were doing our uh, three dory trips in Grand Canyon, we would occasionally mess up, and this would happen. But uh, we're prepared to fix things like this. So this is in the evening after the accident, and the next morning after we worked on the boat. Granite Falls Rapid. Uh, this is the so-called ninth or tenth wave in Hermit. And Hermit, like a lot of rapids in Grand Canyon, has been getting bigger and bigger. Uh, it used to be that you could go through Hermit right down the middle, and it was a big roller coaster ride, and there wasn't much danger of overturning. But at 17,000 or 18,000 cubic feet per second, that's really changed. Um, smaller boats really have to be lucky to get through here without flipping. Uh, so this is the ninth or tenth wave. Uh, the wave count doesn't always uh, match person to person or time to time. But what can happen here is that if you get turned sideways in this wave, and of course there's no time to recover before you hit the wave below. Uh, this is rather a new wave, but farther upstream. And we're looking at the river from the other side now. We're looking uh, with upstream to the right. This is a, a raft coming out of the fifth wave and a raft going into the fifth wave, but missing something. <laughs> and I don't know if it was because it was a foregone gone conclusion that this boat would flip, and so the boatman just decided to jump it out, jump out and get it over with, or whether he was knocked out farther upstream. I don't know if any of you have seen a video that was made on a Diamond River Adventures trip of a private group going through uh, but a uh, video made here, and a boat surfs this wave for 50 seconds. Pretty amazing. Uh, these people are thinking about riding with me through Marble Falls. <laughs> They're concerned. Uh, even the big rigs can sometimes have trouble. Uh, you know, you can go on a river trip, and the experts, the uh, commercial pilots, can make it look easy. And to some degree, they have to be lucky too, but they can make it look so easy, and then the next trip, stuff happens. And so it is partly luck. In this case, I was on a hatch boat here, and we had clobbered our motor up here in Dubendorf Rapid and floated on downstream and got caught in between this boulder and this one. And while we were deflating some of the tubes and using ropes and trying everything to get it off of the rocks it was sitting upon, uh, this western rig came down and also clobbered its motor up there and plowed into our boat and almost knocked it on through. Not quite, but uh, this happened and none of us could believe it. And the boatman in the second boat yelled out, Hey, you need some help? <laughs> uh, it took a while to get these boats off the rocks. This is after a particularly bad accident on the river. <laughs> no, it's a Bureau of Reclamation experiment that was run a few years ago. Halloween on the river. In the summer, especially in western Grand Canyon when it's really hot, it can be 110, 115, 120 degrees. Uh, sometimes you just get out your lawn chairs and just sit right in the river if it's uh, late in the afternoon. One thing that's really changed on the river in Grand Canyon are the meals. Uh, back in the 1960s, uh, it was basically just canned goods. That's what you would have for uh, dinner, for instance. Uh, but today, we fix really elaborate meals. I know that I eat better when I'm on the river than when I'm at home. Uh, but uh, there's one danger in all of this good food, and that is, especially after a big Mexican